Welcome in. We are here in Birmingham at Mill Fit headquarters here with my good friend Thomas Cox. And look, it's time to thrive. It is. It is. <laughs> <laughs> well, welcome in. I'm glad you had time to, uh, to join me yeah. today uh, and to come in and be able to get on camera, be able to get on radio right. and uh, do the, the entire backstory of really who right. is Thomas Cox, right? And, and we see you, uh, your nutrition guide. We see you're incredibly fit. You know, I, I know you didn't just wake up and no. you became an action figure. Where, where did it all start? <laughs> Absolutely not. No, and that's the funny thing is you, you hear people – Say, well, you know, hey, can you help me look this? I was like, yeah, but you got to understand this. This is not a six-week process to where, you know, I mean, I've been lifting weights and working out and doing this since I was 12. And very really? rarely. So I, I should have started years ago. You should have started years ago. <laughs> now, not to say that you can't make a change because everybody can make a change. But just, I mean, <clears throat> my dad's built well. Uh, my mom's built well. We've got good genetics. But also, it's a lot of freaking hard work. I mean, yep. I don't miss many days. A week, I'm six days a week at least. Sometimes seven. Six days. Yeah, a week? but but you got to understand, I'm not just. I'm 45 minutes. I'm in. I'm out and fast. But I'm moving. I'm do, moving with intention every day. So, it's it's not just something that you do. It's it's a long process of different things. So, so when you wake up, it, meal fitted really for you is just a lifestyle. Absolutely. I mean, it's not even. It's not the food and the. Uh, the little ready-to-go pans, right. it's not the workouts, it's not, you know, this nutrition guy. It's the entire thing. It's how you start your day. Absolutely. It's all It's all how – it's It's a whole lifestyle process. And so, I mean, like I said, we've been working out and doing moving since since I was 12 years old. My dad let me start working out when I was in middle school. Didn't let me start working out until middle school because I wanted to start before then, but he didn't let me yeah. until then. And we did it because of football. You know, because I was – I'm from Birmingham, played high school and college football here in Birmingham, just Leonard Huey Town High School. And then went on to UAB and played at UAB. I was an average football player, but I worked hard, so it, it gave me some advantages. Um, and we got to ask, what position did you play? I played quarterback. Played oh, quarterback. okay. So Look, you, you can't hide it. When no, you play quarterback, absolutely, it shows. Absolutely not. So, I mean, I was, a, <laughs> I was an average player, but worked hard and helped us get out of situations. Uh, wasn't great. Ended up my senior year getting beat out by Daryl Hackney, who's the best quarterback to ever come through UAB. I mean, <laughs> he's an unbelievable player. Uh, so, uh, did that. Went Started coaching. High school, because all I wanted to do was coach football. You just love being around the sport. That's it. Well, I was running since I was five. My dad was a coach for 30-something years, and yeah. so that's what the, what I did. So my whole goal when I go into college, I didn't care anything about school. I was a 3.0 kid. I didn't miss class. I, I think a lot of us can relate to that. Yeah. We didn't care about school yet. Didn't care about school because <laughs> I knew I was going to go coach. Yeah. You know, so I, I did that. Went to Atlanta. Lived for two years over there. Loved living over there. All I did was work. I coached. I taught school. I would clean buildings at night. I had no friends. All I did was work. So I made some money, but I, I did. I, but I kept some money. That's all I did. And then uh, I got a job. I got married and then got a job at NC State University. And so I had kind of started the process of my, quote, dream of coaching college football. And I worked for a guy that had been in the NFL for 20 years. And he had a skewed, not skewed, just a different thought process of how to work. And we were just massive amount of hours. So like 90, 95, 100 hours a week for six months straight because that's what he knew. Because in the NFL, the players, people don't understand this, NFL players, it's a job. They get there at 8 or 9, yeah. they leave at 4 or 5. They're there all day. They're yeah. not practicing all day, but they're meeting. So in the NFL, these coaches, they meet with the players and mess with the players all day, and then at night they have to get prepared on their own. And so those guys are literally working 16, 17 hours a day. And so when you do that for 20 years, that's all you know. And so I got indoctrinated into that thought process. So we were at NC State for two years, got get, all get fired. Just, <laughs> just it's not. <laughs> it's not funny. No, but it's not a matter of if; it's a matter of when in college yeah. football. Everybody's been fired at some point or another. So we get fired, and then we moved to Cookville, Tennessee, where we absolutely loved. So me and my wife were both from Birmingham, but we we were in Cookville, Tennessee. We were there eleven years. Absolutely loved it. Well, wait, wait, hold on. What brought you to Cookville? Where, where in the, where in the world did Cookville just come up in the conversation? So we got, we got fired at NC State. My wife was doing wonderful. Had a great job as a head volleyball coach. We get fired, and then Watson Brown, who used to be the head football coach at UAB, who coached me, along with Pat Sullivan at UAB, Watson quasi retired and goes back to Cookville because he's from Cookville. Oh, Watson and Watson and okay. Mac are both from Cookville, and so he goes back to Tennessee Tech. He grew up watching Tennessee Tech play. Just like we grew up watching Alabama and Auburn play, Watson grew up watching Tennessee Tech play because his best friend's dad was the coach. It's just a long, really cool story. Yeah. So he goes home, in essence, and honestly, Ford, it was crazy because for the first time in 38 years, we won a conference championship at that place. 
And so I go to coach there. I coach receivers for the first two years and then coach offensive line. So you went wild. It I was, mean, you go there, you win a conference championship, 30 years. Thirty. It's bonkers. 38 years of nothing, and then all of a sudden we win one. And it wasn't because of us. We, changed the, we did change the culture and changed the way they did things, recruited great players, and, and we won. It's, and it was awesome because – you know, Watson gets a bad rap sometimes of having – I mean, because he's in, like, record books of, like, most losses in the history of the NCAA. It's crazy. Goodness. But he won his first conference championship, so it was a big deal to him. Yeah. Big deal to all of us because it was a big deal for the school but also a big deal for Watson. And so we, we did that. Well, in that process, we got involved with CrossFit. So a guy named Chip Pugh was there, and he introduced CrossFit to me, but he also introduced CrossFit to a guy named Rich Froning. And so the, the three of us – kind of got into this whole CrossFit thing together right before CrossFit was really cool. Because now CrossFit's really cool. There's a CrossFit gym on every corner and all this stuff. When you get involved in that, they really force nutrition down your throat. So I'm coaching and training a ton all at the same time. Yeah. My wife gets involved with it. She starts training a ton. We end up qualifying and going to the CrossFit games. Crazy. So you and your wife at this time are both ripped. I, I, Right. Yes. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. You're yeah, pretty good yeah. shape. Exactly. Like you don't have to hide it. We yeah. Don't. So <laughs> we do this, but that's all we did. I mean, we yeah. worked, we raised kids, and we trained. <laughs> that's all we did. I mean, and our friend, and we got our friends to training. So, you know, where people would go to other people, others' houses and drink wine and eat, we would go lift and then hang out. That's what we did all the time. Yeah. And so it and it was our life, and we loved it. You know. <laughs> so we did that. Then I got out of coaching. I had we had our second child, and I got out of coaching. What made you get out of coaching? Was it was it the child or was it, you know, the time commitment that was coaching? Yes. It was just the time commitment. It was both. Yeah. But I'm sure you still love it. It was just so, – So most, your time up. most people get out of a job because they w- come home every day and they hate their job. Yeah. Not the case with me. Yeah. I love my job. I went from having a zero, hardly any salary to making pretty darn good money. And – but I was raising college kids. And I realized – that I needed to start raising my own kids. So when we had Tegan, my second, my, our second child, my little boy, I realized it was time for me to go. And I hated it because I loved what I did, but I loved my kids more. And my dad was a high school coach for 30 years. He was gone a lot. He was a good dad, but sucker was gone a lot. So I was yeah. raised a lot by my mom. And so I knew that I had to get out. So I got out and had, I, like, literally quit with no, no job in sight. Walk, boss walks in and says, hey, what are you thinking? I'm like, hey, coach, I'm, I'm not – I'm done. I'm not going to do this next year. He goes, well, what are you going to do? I was like – I may go back to cleaning those buildings again. I got nothing. <laughs> I got nothing. So I ended, up st- I ended up working at a church. We'd always been involved in church. I was, you know, Lord, yeah. I, Lord, I was in church nine months before I was born. My mom played the organ. So – We'd always been involved. That's in what you listen to. Exactly. Usually, usually people have the have little headphones exactly. on the, <laughs> You were just playing the organ. Uh, exactly. So I had always been involved in church, and so I started working at a church. I didn't preach or anything like that. I was just coordinating the building, coordinating the events, all those different types of things. It was wonderful. But, when, but what happened is a guy walked into my office and said, hey, can you help me figure out what to eat? So in the process of this CrossFit thing, I had learned about nutrition. I'm totally self-taught. I mean, I've got a history degree and a master's in education administration and sports management. So I don't have any background as far as the nutrition is concerned. But I'm self-taught. From you also don't have the proof that your nutrition. No, there's works. no. But there's. But here's the thing. I learned this from Brian McKenzie. If you're going to give people advice, you've got to study number one, and number two, you've got to experiment. But you've got to experiment on yourself. And so anything that I recommend that someone does, I have done before. I mean, from keto, we were doing keto before keto was cool. I mean, that the keto diet. We were keto, Whole30, Paleo, counting macros. Did y'all call it those names back then? Too? Yeah, we we did because it was like super new because yeah. people were doing this that keep the quote keto diet before uh, like they were doing it to help with diseases and things like that people weren't doing it to, these way these people use it for losing weight yeah you know we were doing it for energy and for just health benefits and so we've done all vegetarian we've done vegan we've done all those different things simply because i felt like if i was giving advice i needed to do that so i started doing meal plans for people well we've had thousands of people in 25 different countries do our meal plans that are online and so we started doing that. And then about six months into working at the church, my wife comes in and she says, hey, you realize that you're working coaching hours again. And I went, dang it. You're right. I'm back. I'm back. <laughs> and so I'd work 40 hours a week and then go home at night, put the kids to bed. I'd work six or seven hours, five or six hours at night, communicate with people all over the world doing these meal plans. Yeah. And so I went Because people all over the world probably don't realize, hey, I'm on Central Time. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Don't call me. It's 11 o'clock at night. <laughs> I know it's 3 o'clock in the afternoon for you. So we started doing that. And as we did that, um, it started to grow. Yeah. 
and I realized I had to put something down, so I went part-time at the church. And then at the back end of that thing, that, that part-time at the church, I started making food. I rented a 444-square-foot kitchen in the middle of nowhere and learned the process of the volume cooking, cooking for 30 and 40 and 100 and 200 people. And that, in, that, in that process, along with the help from a guy named Randy Kiefer, I learned the whole smoking process, the smoking meats and different things like that. And that's what we love to do. But we, all, we do so many different things. But we grew out of that 444-square-foot kitchen to a larger space in downtown, and we started doing multiple things from the catering and the meal prep were the main two things. And then we had an opportunity to come to Birmingham. And I never thought I would come back here, ever. Really? No, because we would come back here for Christmas and Thanksgiving and vacations and things like that. And we always looked, me and my wife always looked at her and said, I don't, I don't ever feel drawn to come back to Birmingham. We so lo- what, what, was the, what was the hook, line, sinker? What, what was the, the fish line that got you to come so back here? So the thing that I feel, like, I feel like the Lord brought us back, I really do, is because is you feel so strongly about something for so long, and then all of a sudden you get into a situation where, you know, you do feel called. What changed? Only thing that can change from that perspective is what the Lord does in your life. Yeah. And so, <clears throat> I was my best friend from co- my best friend from college, and my roommate in college was Mark Pettis. Mark is the president of Highlands College, which is a college that is run by or birthed from Church of the Highlands. Yeah. So Mark calls three years ago and says, "Hey, come be a head of health and wellness and help me run this college." I said, "No." And then, <laughs> and then I did. I just <laughs> said, "No, it wasn't time." <laughs> and then two years later. He called, or a year later, or excuse me, a year ago, he calls and says, hey, the church has bought Grant, the building at Grandview, the old Scrooge Center, and that's going to be the new campus of Highlands College. And he said, come do all our food. And at this time, the food aspect of what we've done had grown so much. Yeah. And so we came here, we're here at Grandview, at the old, like the old Scrooge Center, the old Health South building. Everybody remembers that place because it was right outside the. Well, I think everybody had their prom here in no high question. school between, <laughs> between the, the days of 05 and 14. No question. You, if you had a prom, a gala, <laughs> a fundraiser, a Finley show, Award, anything. Anything yeah. like that, Monday Morning Quarterback Club, yes. it was here. And so the church bought this building and closed it down to private events. And so now it's just the church, the church's, one of the church's campuses. But also in 2020, this will be a college campus. I mean, a full-fledged college campus. Labs, you know, gyms, classrooms, all these cafeteria, all these different types of things. And we're, Milfit is in charge of running all the food for all those kids. And so our job now is to, to grow our catering and meal prep business so that we can have a business along with running the college campus in yeah. 2020. Because I, I can only imagine how busy the cafeteria and yeah. everything else is going to be on top of having your meal prep and catering. Right. right. It, it will. It's going to be something that's going to take a, a gigantic team to do, but you know, we're going slow. Thank goodness they didn't throw me into this fire in 2020 when, hey, you got to go feed 800 kids a day, three times a day, and then also <laughs> go ahead and try to make run your own business too. It, yeah. it wouldn't a lot have happened. And so the whole process with Mark helping along the way has been wonderful, and we've loved being back in Birmingham. We've been in Birmingham uh, since October of 17, and so it's been wonderful being here. But – it's not Cookville. It's different. It's a different thought process than where we came from, and it's taken some time to adjust. We love it here, but we also love our friends and our families back in Cookville, Tennessee, just because it's a, such a wonderful town. Yeah. So where do you see kind of the movement of Milfit throughout the next two years? Because you talk about 2020, this becomes right. a real college campus, Absolutely. and you've got kids crawling all over the place. Right. You also have your business to run. Where do you see y'all, and by y'all, Milfit.co, growing along with Highlands College? So I think the, the business aspect of what we're doing, my goal is to grow our catering business and our meal prep business to touch as many lives as we can. Um, from a catering perspective, we can do events from the 20-person office lunch to thousands of people at a box lunch or a thousands of people at a buffet. We can do all of those different things. And so I want to grow that business to be an amazing, sustainable, life-giving business that can help so many people, but also be a profitable business. I mean, yeah. this is not... I mean, we've got a wonderful facility here. Let's leverage what we have to make as much and do as much. And also the meal prep thing. The meal prep thing is huge because I feel like I'm helping people because everyone talks about wanting to lose weight, wanting to eat better, wanting to get fit. And there's a huge knowledge and action gap between wanting to do it or having the wisdom to know what to do and doing it. Yeah. I want to help provide people with 
the means to do that. So that's where our meal prep stuff comes in because, I mean, the biggest concern, like you, for example, you know, I ain't got time to cook. I don't know what to cook. All that. You, you can figure out what to cook, number one. But knowing how and doing <laughs> it is, is a whole different ballgame. Yeah. And if I can provide food for you that you can just take and eat and still remain healthy, I feel like I've done my part. It's not like putting a hot pocket in the microwave. Absolutely you, not. You put meat and potatoes in the microwave, right. and a minute 30 later, you're sitting there, you're full, right. you know you've eaten well, and you know it doesn't take up an hour out of your day to go there, uh, to go to the grocery store, get it, come back home, try to cook it, figure out how to cook it yep. for my you know, my purposes, right. just for me, and then uh, you know, I'm done five minutes, ten minutes, I have a dinner, I'm good to go, Right. let's move on to the next thing. Our, our thought process and how we do things is we're not low carb, we're not high carb, we're not keto, we're not mac, eat real food. If I can get you to eating real food, meaning food that has one ingredient, if my nine-year-old can't pronounce the ingredients on the back of the package, you probably don't need to be eating <laughs> <laughs> that's something that's a good litmus test to go really? by. Really? Yeah. If you can look at the back of the package and your nine year old can't read the words, you probably don't need to be eating it. But if they can, but if, if we can eat as many one ingredient things as possible chicken, meat, pork, or broccoli, vegetables, whatever thing, that's where we want to live. We want to live in the way of, hey, let's eat as few of ingredients as possible and have a sustainable life, number one, and then move. Everyone's move is different. My dad's move at 68 years old is walking. I talked to him this morning. He's walking. My mom, she has a trainer that she works with, and they, they lift weights. She's 69. <laughs> but she's doing it what she can do. Staying active. Staying active. Where, you know, these college kids that are wanting to go to the CrossFit games and look, you know, amazing naked, their dudes are lifting heavy weights and high intensity and all these different things. Everybody's move is different. You got to figure out what your mood move is, and get uncomfortable, and continue to do that every day. You got to get uncomfortable, and you got to do it every day. So you, you talk about moving, but meal fit really it sets in place to make it so easy. It's like an easy access road to get your food, to get it in and out. What we talked about, and then the move. You know, I feel so inspired after I eat something so good and eat meats and eat real food. Right. I feel inspired to go move, like what you're talking about. Absolutely. So the, when you consume sugar, it causes you in, in your mind to just say, ah, screw it, day's blown, I'm going to go ahead and eat another Twinkie or I'm going to go ahead and do this, I'm not going to do anything. But if you're fueling yourself with things that are good for you, you're more likely to go put that into action and do better with what you're do, do better with life. Or even if you're just eating better, it's more motivation to continue eating better yeah. and maybe not move. I would say this. The first part is is adjusting your nutrition. If you can adjust your food and just eat real food, you're going to be fine. Obviously, on top of that, moving is going to help you as well. But the first thing we've got to do is fix your, fix your food. I've always heard about food is kind of like either the friends you surround yourself with or the thoughts um, that you let yourself think, like what kind of media and stuff you mm -hmm. consume. Like if you're consuming, you know, bad things on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, you're obviously your thoughts are going to be skewed, right? Absolutely. It's kind of like food. Like if you go and get your food through a window every night, you know, what are you going to do the next day? Or what are you going to think about when it's 11 o'clock? You know you should just go ahead and go to bed, but you go and you find the, the nearest drive through right. to go fulfill yourself. Yeah, and I've got buddies that own fast food restaurants. i got a friend of mine in Tennessee that owns – 30-something McDonald's, those dudes are in for a profit. We're all in it for a profit. Yeah. I, mean, I get it. But the way they make a profit is off creating a mass amount, holding it is, and ordering as much as they can to get as big of a price break. They get a big price break because they order so much. They order so much because they have to keep it longer. It's loaded with preservatives and different things like that that physically aren't good for us. Hence why the obesity, you know, this is another whole other show, hence why the obesity rate and all these things are, are so bad because we're consuming so many different things that we didn't consume 50, 60, 100 years ago. What about when you go out to eat? How would you say that food kind of compares to, you know, the food you make at MillFit? So one of the things you have to under, understand is that we're all in a service industry, MillFit, any restaurant. Now. So if you go into a restaurant and say, I want X, Y, and Z, I want meat, vegetables, and maybe some starch, they're going to do it. It may be a little bit more expensive because it's not technically on the menu, but they're going to do it for you because they're in a service industry. And if they're not going to do it for you, th you need to find someone else, yeah. so another place to go. But you can go out to eat and be s perfectly safe. You just have to make better decisions. Yeah. You have to, again, have to eat food with one ingredient. 
one in, or two ingredients so that it's you know that you're getting real food. And, and this isn't a thing like where, oh, i got to eat a salad every no. day or man, all I can eat is a zucchini. You know no, what I mean? Absolutely not. This is something where, and my favorite thing is the Bama Bowl, yeah. right? This is something where you're getting – chicken, steak, stirring it up in rice. You have some kind of sauce right. that if you gave it to the Middle East, there'd be peace. Absolutely. I mean, it's incredible. There's no question. And and to me, I just think if it's good for me to eat, because, look, I love to eat food. No I question. mean, you can yeah. tell. I, I, I grew up, I think, with <laughs> yeah. white sauce in my bottle. There's no I, doubt. You know what I mean? I love to eat. But when I'm looking forward to eating healthy, like you have provided with meal fit, mm-hmm. I think for me – that can relate to so many other people who kind of struggle with the same thing I do. Absolutely. So if you can, we can provide people something and make it easier for them. It's not as it's not as far off of a thought process to eat healthy because some people think, well, I can't do it. Well, if you think you can and you think you can't, you're right. It's all about what you think you can do. And if if we can provide you something to where it makes it a lot easier for you to do that, it will make your life easier. And that's that's part of our goal and what we're doing is to make people's life e- lives easier. Because here's the thing. One thing that's never going to change is people are not going to get less busy. Yeah. They're not. They're always going to try to put something more on their plate. They, they think they can handle They are. I mean, me included. I, I try to do that all the time. Exactly. And so if I can make your life easier because you're, I know you're not going to slow down, that's, that's when I feel like I've reached our purpose. Yeah. And I feel like milfit.co, you know, it, it really is the time to thrive. I know we that's say right. it, but it really gives you a time to thrive, and it gives you – a plan to do it and it gives you time to actually eat healthy and like you always say and to move absolutely so I, I feel like that what we're doing is a good thing i feel like what we're doing is on purpose with what the lord has for us but it's also fun we're having a good time doing it well, i know i'm having a good time with this thomas awesome. thanks so much for coming yes, on today has been fantastic time to thrive thomas yes, cox mealfit.co you can find them basically anywhere and your uh, your Instagram handle as well. I know that's my yep. favorite place to go because it reminds me how delicious the food looks right. as well. Right, and it's <laughs> it's an easy way that, that we can get in touch. I get a lot of people that can communicate to us through all our social platforms, and Instagram just seems to be one that we're – we're on more, more so because it's the hottest one right yeah. now. It's but fun too. Well, yeah, the, yeah. the stories are fun, and I can and I can see what everybody's doing, and and mm. the products people like. Right. That's my favorite part. Is that you know if one of my friends is over here eating MillFit.co, you know, hey, I'm gonna go check right. it out. Correct. And so that that's what I find is uh, is one of the more fun things about Instagram. So right. we'll find you there. Yep. Uh, we'll be listening to you uh, every other week yep. here on Thursdays on the Ford Faction. So I'm incredibly excited about it. Thomas can't thank you enough. We'll see you in a couple weeks. Awesome. Thanks. All right, sounds see good. You.